Welcome to Intergenerational Politics with Jill Weinbanks and Victor Shear, where we host weekly political discussions with experts around the country that are engaging and relevant to all generations. Uh, I'm Victor Shear. I'll be an incoming freshman next year at UCLA, also the co-host of this podcast with Jill. And I'm Jill Weinbanks, the author of The Watergate Girl, about my experience as the only woman on the trial team for the Watergate case and host of this show with Victor. Today's episode will feature something that Jill and I feel is very important, especially in this election with Kamala Harris, a woman of color on the ticket as vice president. As did Hillary Clinton, Kamala represents the progress that has been made for women's rights and equality, but also the continued attacks on her prove how much work still must be done to achieve women's rights and equality in this country. So to help us discuss some of the battles women face in the political arena and other industries, as well as the importance of women being civic, uh, civically and politically active, we are so glad to be joined by Tina T. Chen. Uh, Tina is a lawyer who co-founded and now serves as president of CEO and CEO of Times Up Now and the Times Up Foundation, overseeing the organization's strategic plans to change culture, companies, and laws in order to make work safe fair and dignified for women of all kinds. Her work centers on issues related to gender inequity, sexual harassment, and lack of diversity in the workplace. In addition, through Time's Up uh, Legal Defense Fund, uh, which she also co-founded, thousands of people are connected to legal or PR support for sexual harassment across dozens of different industries. So uh, before joining Time's Up, Tina was also an assistant to uh, President Barack Obama, Executive Director of the White House Council on Women's and Women and Girls, and Chief of Staff to First Lady Michelle Obama, and has been a partner at two law firms. So first, Thanks so much for being here, Tina. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I'm particularly thrilled to have another Chicago Network member as one of our guests today. And um, I want to set the background for some of the questions for you by talking about basically the Watergate era where I was, as I just mentioned, the only woman on the trial team. And sexism was rampant at the time. It was was more focused on discrimination and gender bias, uh, not so much the sexual assault that has become prevalent now. Um, when I was in law school, only 4% of all lawyers were female and only 5% of my class was female. Um, my fellow students, males would say, someone is going to die in Vietnam because you took their rightful place in the class and you'll never practice law anyway. In job interviews, I was asked what kind of birth control I used and how many children I plan to have. Um, and then of course, when I started trying cases, sexism was a strategy of defense lawyers often. And it, it was a really um, dramatic time for women trying to enter the field. Um, even judges would say things like when I was cross-examining a defendant to the Watergate case, now, Mr. Mardian, don't you know you can never win an argument with a lady? And um, I mean, I'm sure that you have gone through some of these exact same things. Now we've come you know, a long way toward ending this uh, by having, for example, Kamala Harris and Hillary Clinton as uh, candidates for president and vice president, but we still face attacks. We haven't yet cracked the highest ceiling and I'm just wondering if you can talk about why in 2020, I still hear from law students and young professionals that their experience in the workplace isn't that different from what I faced when I started practicing in 1968 or in 1978 or in 1988. Um, they feel they have to be twice as good to be considered half as good. And um, I, I actually thought of about calling the Watergate girl something like the only woman in the room or dancing backwards in high heels. But um, I'm so happy that Time's Up exists and um, that you are focused on changing the culture and institutions in order to eliminate the harassment, the assault, the barriers that women face. So I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about what Time's Up is doing to bring about that kind of change. Uh, well, thank you, Jill, and thank you, Victor. And, and Jill has not only been a longtime friend, she's been one of my heroes for a long time because I will tell you, I watched those Watergate hearings. I, you know, you and I are of the, the age that I can say that I watched those Watergate hearings. I noticed you there as, as the woman and sort of reveled in the fact that you were there. Um, and so thank you. 
and for your outspokenness all the way through to the present day as well. I'm a big fan for those of you who don't watch MSNBC. Um, you know, Jill was just, you know, all during the impeachment hearings, sort of the voice of history and reason and normalcy. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of questions in there. You know, first of all, it is absolutely true that although things are better, so instead of 5% of law school classes, women have actually been at or pretty near 50% of law school graduating classes, not just recently, but for decades, right? Yeah. For at least almost 20 years or more, you know, women have been 50% of those law school classes. The problem is that, you know, in this day and age, they are still just barely 20% of equity partners of large law firms. So even though this is not an incoming pipeline issue, we are still losing women as we go up the ranks. I think the American lawyer estimated that the current rate of change for women in the legal practice, we would get to parity in 2181. Oh. Yeah. So like a hundred, whatever the math is, right? 160 years from now, we would get to parity at the rate of change oh we are doing goodness. on women's representation at the top of the legal profession. So that tells you that although things are better, <laughs> they haven't, you know, they still haven't changed a lot. Um, and it's, I think, because of the broader culture, Jill and Victor. I mean, you know, we are really talking about changing cultural norms about women, about women's leadership that have existed for generations, right? You know, I mean, gender discrimination, I often say, is a thing that has transcended time and geography and race and religion, right? It's everywhere. It's literally written into the Bible. I mean, it, it you know, that's the pervasiveness of the gender norms we're trying to change. And so, you know, in some ways we shouldn't be surprised that it's taken so long. Um, but it does really put a, you know, put an exclamation point on the urgency to doing things, you know, right now. Um, now for Time's Up, you know, we were born um, out of the news reporting, you know, by the New York Times and the New Yorker magazine, now almost exactly three years ago, right? It was in October of 2017 that the first Harvey Weinstein articles appeared really ripping the covers off of this secret that he was a pervasive and serial sexual harasser. Mm -hmm. And then it turns out lots of other people were too. And what was so astonishing about it, I think at the time was there were all these women in Hollywood who thought they were the only one, right? They had kept quiet. They were, there was a whole system to keep things quiet, whether it was, you know, signing up non-disclosure agreements so they couldn't talk after there was a settlement or threatening them with defamation suits if they you know, ever thought about speaking up publicly against powerful men. And the Weinstein story, I think, resonated so much and had the impact that it did because for the first time, it actually showed other women that they weren't alone. And once those brave initial women started speaking, then many more did. And then you had the, the, the real beauty of the social media moment that we're in that allowed through Alyssa Milano's retweeting of Tarana Burke's hashtag me too, right? And Tarana had started that hashtag many years before, but it didn't quite get the traction it did until Alyssa retweeted it. You know, if this has happened to you, then hashtag me too. And thousands of women, right, came forward. Um, and that really just set a very different tone. And so Time's Up was born out of that, out of the women of Hollywood who came together, who had realized they weren't alone, but to their credit, realized they were women of privilege and wanted to do something in that moment that would benefit women across industries and especially low wage women. Uh, and so that's how the first initiative was born, the Times of Legal Defense Fund that I helped put together, housed at the National Women's Law Center. Uh, we famously raised $24 million in, in, in a, all at once in early 2018. 100% of it went to the National Women's Law Center to fund the legal services and PR services that both survivor wants to speak out to support, you know, women who, and men, you know, who have been, you know, the survivors of workplace sexual harassment. Um, but we didn't want to just stop there, right? We didn't want to just constantly be picking up the pieces of the aftermath of sexual harassment when it occurs, but we want to imagine a world where workplace sexual harassment doesn't happen. And that 
that's, you know, what I'm doing. So the part of Time's Up I am now president and CEO of is Time's Up Foundation and Time's Up Now, which are our advocacy and policy and research arms that is really imagining a work where, uh, a world where work is safe, fair, and dignified for everyone, for women, for men, for people of color, for LGBTQ, for disabled workers, you know, where everyone is really able to reach their full potential. And that means being diverse, right? Being, having good sexual, anti-sexual harassment policies in place, but also having good equal pay policies in place and paid leave and childcare and all, you know, addressing all of the barriers that have kept women back for so many years and decades in the workplace, finally really addressing those and making our workplaces truly, truly inclusive. So that's our that's our broad mission. That's an amazing mission. I mean, you have a very, very broad mission to change the institutions, the power structure, to make women feel safe, to even the playing field. Um, you, and you're addressing both the causes and finding solutions to that, which is, an amazing, amazing thing. So thank you and congratulations on that. Um, I just want to draw a distinction. You're saying sexual harassment. Um, Harvey Weinstein, and I would consider in the category of sexual assault, mm -hmm. uh, which can be part of the bad workplace environment, bad workplace culture. And it's certainly a form of harassment, but um, I, I do want to sort of distinguish between assault and harassment um, and, and the bad workplace. You know, you raise a really important point, Joe, which is that, you know, when it happens in the workplace, we're talking about a range of behaviors, right? And they range from outright criminal sexual assault and rape, right? You know, what Harvey Weinstein did was rape, you know, what Les Moonves did in his office, you know, was rape and sexual assault. Um, but it also isn't, you know, manifest, it doesn't manifest itself just in that. Right. It goes all the way to, you know, the dirty joke, right? The, you know, the sort of verbal um, harassment that occurs, the just excluding somebody on the basis yes. of their gender, you know, from key meetings when people have spoken up. Um, you know, so there is a range of behaviors. And I've been cognizant in the wake of Harvey Weinstein that, you know, everyone sort of tends to see it through its most egregious lens. Right. But when we talk about changing culture, we've got to change those behaviors that quite frankly, under the current definitions of the law, aren't even illegal, right? And they're not illegal because, not because they're wrong, but because the legal definition sets the bar really low for bad behavior, <laughs> as, as we know. Um, and there are yeah. lots of things that are behaviors that are toxic and that exclude people that are not under the current definitions of the law, you know, really illegal. But I say to employers all the time, they probably don't represent the company that you want to be running, right? And so you really got to set the bar higher. That's the aspiration that we should all be working towards. Right, right. And there's so much, like you said, that happens within the workforce. But I just want to focus on some of the difficulties that are associated with women even before they enter that position. Um, there's this one Hewitt Packard study that I read somewhere that stated that when men apply for jobs, they believe they only need 60% of the qualifications, while women uh, believe they need all of the qualifi qualifications and more even to apply for the job. So um, to get started on that aspect, how do we change that attitude on part of the female applicants when they do apply for that job? Well, it's a good point, Victor. Uh, you know, um, uh, Caddy Kay and um, uh, uh, her partner sort of put together a book of, called The Confidence Code, you know, that really documented that, you know, girls up until about middle school age have about the same level of confidence in their own abilities as boys do. And it's really starting all the way back in middle school where, where the cliff starts to happen, where, you know, girls start to get the message that, no, maybe you can't really do computer coding or math or science, or you're not really good enough to speak out, or I'm going to call on the boys more than the girls. You know, some of it goes all the way back to that point in time where women's confidence starts to get eroded mm -hmm. and other confidence in ourself gets eroded. Um, and one of the things, you know, I say to young women when I speak to them all the time is to find that voice. Don't, don't, don't listen to the external voices, find that internal voice for yourself that supports you. But you know, to bring things current to one of the issues Jill raised, it also has to do with what are the signals we're sending in our external culture around women's leadership, right? What are we saying about women's leadership to those young girls who are developing their confidence or who are applying for jobs? And 
That's what brings us to the current moment in the political sphere that we're operating in. Um, so one of the things we did at Time's Up in August of this year was to start a project with other you know, women's leaders like Cecile Richards and Fatima Gus Graves at the Law Center and others, um, a project called We Have Her Back. And it was launched on August 6th, you know, the weekend before the VP announcement of Senator Harris was made to be the first woman of color running, you know, for VP on a major party ticket. Um, because we knew actually as women and Jill, you, you know, you're, you're one of those folks too who knew what was gonna come to whomever the woman VP candidate was going to be was the kinds of attacks that were not based on her record or her experience, but were based on who she was and the fact she was a woman and what she wore and what her facial expressions were like. And, you know, Peggy Noonan's piece over this last weekend on the fact that she was dancing when Donald Trump like really awkwardly dances all the time. Um, <laughs> You know, and that's all part of, again, our culture and how we belittle women leaders and view them through a lens of sexism and in the case of Senator Harris, also racism. And, you know, that's what we have her back is that we started this project. We work with Edelman Data and Intelligence. So we get an overnight report every day from Edelman of where there has been sexist and racist and misogynistic reporting. We send it out to over 300 um, organizations and individuals so that they can have her back and tweet it out and call it out. Um, I think we've been in, you know, over, you know, um, 125,000 articles and Twitter, you know, feeds saying we have her back reaching nearly 15 billion people to really call this kind of misogyny and racism out when it happens. Uh, and you really need it. Uh, Peggy Noonan's article this past weekend was almost the latest example. The weekend when we announced we have her back, like you couldn't have scripted this, you know, if I were writing a, 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 a tele, you know, some, some sort of script, you know, movie script. Uh, we launched We Have Her Back the Friday before the VP announcement. The next day, Saturday, August 7th, the New York Times ran a piece um, uh, by Maureen Dowd that likened the Geraldine Ferraro moment as she was waiting for the wrist corsage from Walter Mondale to become the VP, right? And then even worse, even worse gets better later the same day. The LA Times, so we're talking about New York Times and LA Times, not like obscure corner of the dark web kind of places. The LA Times ran an article that likened the VP selection process to an episode of The Bachelor and likened the Oval Office to the ultimate fantasy suite, right? And then it goes from there. So obviously, you know, once Senator Harris got announced, she got attacked on the birtherism piece, which we came out against hard. And Newsweek finally had to back down and acknowledge they should, you know, should not have published that piece that tried to make some argument for birtherism. Um, we've been, you know, going after the president's calling her phony or monster. Again, terms which aren't sexualized, but they are the terms to your point, Victor, about confidence, that when you use them against a woman of color running for VP, they send the signal that she's phony because she's trying to be vice president of the United States and women don't belong as vice president of the United States, which is what feeds into that broader culture, back to your question, of women who are applying for jobs. That's the overall culture they are applying for jobs and they are evaluating their own sense of worth in. It's because if Kamala Harris can be called phony, can be called monster, you know, for trying to be, when she has been a US Senator, a state attorney general, a prosecutor. She's built an incredible career of service and talent and skills and knowledge. And yet she still is criticized for what she wears or the look she gives or whether she's smiling at the VP debate or not smiling at the VP debate. Um, that sets a tone in our culture that young women absorb, whether they even know they're consciously absorbing it or not they're absorbing it and it's influencing that point that you were making of why women now, if Kamala Harris with all her credentials has got to go the extra mile to be taken seriously, what do I have to do, right? When I'm just starting out my career to be taken seriously as a woman. And this is why I feel so passionately about what we're doing and we have her back because you know, the ultimate immediate objective is to change reporting about this particular political race, but we're doing it because it has such implications for our broader culture right, for what women in leadership and business in all sorts of realms are combating against, what our kids are watching, right, and what those young women applying for jobs think about themselves, and, and that's the significance. But the fact that we are having the discourse 
around Kamala Harris that we are just shows you how far we have to go, right? We really, we've made some progress because she's there and she's running for VP, but we had clearly not completed the job because we got a long way to go. You are bringing up so many emotions for me right now. As I was listening to you, I, I wish that there had been, we have her back when newspaper headlines said, a lawyer in miniskirts or the leggiest lawyer in town. You can imagine what that did to my confidence going to court the next day, having read a headline like that. Um, and there was no one to defend me. There, there just weren't anybody. I had no colleagues who were female who would stand up for me. And so you're doing something really, really important. Um, and, and for me, it's not just how women feel about applying for jobs, but how women are evaluated in jobs. Um, I've seen it in associate reviews at a law firm where the same behavior in a man is considered assertive, a positive, and bitchy when it's a woman. Sorry for the use of the word, but that's a word that was used. And, um, and calling someone a monster is clearly a gender-based uh, terrible thing to say. And we should hold people accountable for having said that. So I'm glad that, that you exist. I'm wondering what you're trying to get employers to change in the culture to stop this, because I think you're right. We have to change the overall culture to prevent the harassment and bias and discrimination and assault. Um, so is there, do you have anything specific that, that employers yeah. could take on? Yeah, no, well, absolutely. I mean, obviously at a baseline, you know, and lots of employers we've seen do this in the last three years, employers need to change their sexual harassment policies, right? They need to expand their definitions. So they're not just the legal definition. I mean, I, Jill, I could have recited up until three years ago, I probably could have recited from heart the anti-sexual harassment policy of every corporation in America because they all read like the Meritor Bank case. They all just followed the case that define sexual harassment under Title VII. So they all just went to the lowest common denominator definition. And it didn't include things like a bystander, right? Because under Title VII, you know, bystanders aren't explicitly covered. Um, and what a bystander is, is the person who is a coworker who sees something happening, right? And reports it. Under, you know, federal law, they don't really have protections. And so many companies wouldn't protect a bystander who came forward. And now they are, right? Because that's one an example when I say, you know, we gotta have behavior and culture that is beyond the legal limits of the law. That's an example. So that's number one. But number two, Jill, is they, you know, CEOs need to own this, right? They need to own it just like they owned anti-fraud, right? Or just like they own, um, you know, the, the profitability of their company because, you know, what we've seen from things like the Weinstein companies that went bankrupt and like CBS that went into a complete tailspin with Les Moonves, you know, this is, this affects your profitability if you don't have a healthy workplace culture. So CEOs and boards need to own this and need to be paying attention to it. And then, you know, you need to have CEOs who are doing the whole range of looking at their structures, right? Do, are they doing an equal pay study? Do they have truly equal pay? What are their diversity statistics in their hiring practices and then in their promotion practices and their, and to your point, evaluation practices? Um, how do you address microaggressions? And how do you actually teach people about them? Because a lot of folks who are very well-meaning, you know, will have no idea that all they do is talk over women <laughs> on Zoom calls, right? Um, will have, you know, no idea at, that, you know, that, you know, they, when they are dismissive of somebody's childcare responsibilities in this current moment, that is an incredibly exclusionary, sexist sort of comment to make, you know, and will really drive women who are doing this horrible job right now, trying to balance you know, home and work, even remotely doesn't solve it. When you're, I had one woman from a company that I was doing a, a, a conversation with in tears because she said, well, I want to work, but I've got a six-year-old I'm trying to teach to read, yeah. right? You know, um, we have a caregiving crisis that is confronting us and CEOs need to own that, right? And start to figure out ways to address it and invest in their companies. So, you know, that's one of the things I feel strongly about at Time's Up. Our role is not just to hold people accountable, but if we're gonna hold them accountable, we need to help them develop tools to do better. So that's why I'm so excited. We have an impact lab 
at Time's Up that has been seed funded by Melinda Gates and Pivotal Ventures to do research on what's working and what can work and to develop the data that we need to develop new solutions. We're launching um, a real longitudinal data project called Time's Up, Measure Up to really measure the impact of this pandemic on women and especially women of color and low wage workers and be able to do that over time so that we can help influence and fine tune the public policy and private sector responses to rebuilding back our economy in this pandemic moment, you know, so that it works for women, especially those vulnerable workers. Sounds fabulous. Is there any legislation that you're sponsoring or trying to promote that you think might help uh, if we had um, a Congress that was willing to look at equalizing the playing field for women? Yeah, well, there's a lot. There's a lot, you know, we're, we're, we, along with lots of other folks, have been uh, supportive of the Be Heard Act, right, which is changes to, you know, our existing Title VII, you know, laws to, you know, actually, you know, outlaw the use of, you know, non-disclosure agreements, for example, you know, in, in, in employment cases, um, and, you know, to, and to protect bystanders, you know, to protect, put in some of these provisions. And so that's the Be Heard Act. We're supporting the Paycheck Fairness Act, which has been around since before I was in the Obama administration. So we're going, this has been around for like 15 years to actually strengthen equal pay protections um, and to do things like we have in Chicago, you know, which is to ban, you know, uh, employers asking about your prior salary history when you come in so that you don't perpetuate the equal pay, unequal pay that a woman may have had, had in her prior job. Um, and so, you know, th those are just some of the initial things, I think, Jill, that we're going to have to explore. Um, a new thing that I think is going to be top of the agenda that I believe needs to be top of the agenda coming into a new Congress is we're going to have to rebuild our economy back. And so we're going to have to have a big recovery act, as we did 12 years ago with the Obama administration coming in in the Great Recession. And I believe part of that recovery act has got to be to address this caregiving and lack of paid leave situation that we have in the United States. Um, there's four and a half million childcare slots at risk right now. Um, we know that in September, you know, 865,000 women left the workforce in September alone. In a single month, 865,000 women left the workforce. That's because they're confronting this situation, right, of no school, right, no childcare, no possibly a sick spouse or older relative that they need to care for in the middle of a pandemic and no mechanism to balance those. And if that trend continues, we will undo generations of progress that we have made in getting women's labor force participation to be equal of men, because that's what it was. Before the pandemic, we had reached parity of the number of women in the workforce and the number of men in the workforce. But we could undo all of that if we do not solve this caregiving crisis and recognize, you know, in the European countries, they recognize caregiving is a social responsibility. So you have actually the government sponsoring childcare centers and affordable childcare, and you have paid leave. We are the only industrialized country in the world without a national paid leave policy. So we have to get over this thinking that childcare and leave and elder care is something for workers to figure out on our own. That's been the prevailing US attitude and realize this is actually a collective need and public good and invest in it like we invest in public schools and utilities and make sure that workers have what they need to be able to go to the workforce. So I, I just wanna follow up with, I'm wearing a Time's Up pin to support your organization. Is there a way that uh, our listeners can contribute to the work by making a donation? Oh, absolutely. The easiest way to find out how to do that is you can, you can text the word now, N-O-W, to 30644. And that will get you connected to sort of all the information that we have, as well as, you know, you know, making a contribution. We have the Times Up Foundation, which is a 501c3, and we also have a 501c4, um, uh, Times Up Now, that does our advocacy work and is doing the We Have Our Back campaign. Um, and so we would, you know, uh, love to have people involved with us and, you know, involved in the work that we're doing. So it, again, it's the word now, N-O-W to 30644. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so 
Yeah, so we spoke so much about, you know, the change that must happen, some of the legislation you're working on. Um, I want to move on now to kind of what we saw this summer um, after George Floyd's killing in terms of um, just the spark this country had to demand racial justice and equality um, in our country. So from a company's perspective and from an employee's, uh, from an employer's perspective, um, from increasing like diversity in the workforce, can you speak to the importance that, um, and I guess the work that companies have to do in order to achieve the diversity that um, we called so much for this summer? Well, you know, let's be clear, Victor, that these, you know, um, the, the racial reckoning that we have, have confronted, you know, since the summer and the issues I've been talking about all you know, the root of them are, you know, comes from a, the same place, which is power, right? The imbalance of power, you know, that women and black indigenous and people of color, you know, who are workers experience in the workplace and really addressing that power imbalance is what we're talking about. And so it is, you know, patriarchy and, um, and, and institutional racism, you know, sort of have the same origins and, you know, come, spring from the same place. And so we need to attack them both. And especially we know, as we look at the pandemic and the statistics, women of color and black women in particular are bearing the brunt um, of this crisis. You know, we see it Jill, in our legal profession. You know, black women are the most underrepresented in the senior ranks of the law profession, you know, among all other groups. Uh, you know, and we can't really have a justice system if we don't have black women, right? In, you know, as a part of our legal structure and our lawyers and our prosecutors and elsewhere, you know, so that's what we really need to do. And so companies that made statements, right? And spoke out, you know, around Black Lives Matter this summer, you know, the smart ones are doing the work internally right now um, because they know there will be another round of reckoning, I am sure that will come where, People are going to start looking at every company that made a statement and actually want to know what's actually going on. You know, what are the diversity statistics within your company? How are you promoting people? What does your supply chain look like? So it's not just about hiring. It's also about like who you're buying goods and services from as a business, as a company. That's why you see some of the banks, right? So I'll give credit to JP Morgan Chase, to Bank of America, who've just announced not only initiatives to improve their hiring, which they both did, but initiatives on how they are going to invest in black and brown communities, right? Um, and with black and brown businesses, right? So, and women owned businesses, B of A that actually has actually had a terrific women small business um, owner initiative for many years. And so those are the kinds of investments that we really need to see companies making. Yeah, but at the same time, like, um, like so much, I guess, so much of the conversation that I have with my peers is that even when companies do make these statements that they're going to support diversity, they're you know going to increase or they're going to you know buy goods from uh, the right places, um, they oftentimes don't follow up with that. And so I guess for women who are trying to combat this you know unfair working condition, or for women who are trying to really increase diversity in the workforce, what advice would you give them as they do kind of speak up? Uh, despite um, the lack of diversity and kind of unfair work conditions that are uh, sur surrounding them? Well, you know, I think, you know, we need to have better accountability, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that, that, that's what needs to happen. Um, I will see that, say, Victor, it's your generation and the generation above you, right? Um, uh, that, you know, starting with the millennials, you know, and then down to your generation that are very outspoken. I mean, I, I give you all credit for, you know, having accountability as part of what you do. You know, we know from lots of survey research that it is, you know, your generation that really does think about what the values are of the companies that you buy goods and services from. And you are outspoken when they don't match up or you are outspoken about the companies that you work for. And a lot of times, you know, young workers and young talent is voting with its, their feet. Like for example, the Google walkout or other things. And you're all very adept at using social media which is a tool in Jill in my day was not available, right? To really hold someone accountable in a very loud way. You know, back in our day, it took a lot of work for example to organize the great boycott, right? By the United Farm Workers Jill back in the day. You know, which was that time probably one of the most successful corporate actions, right? Perhaps, perhaps the, the the really the first bit of you know corporate activism that we all saw. But that took years to organize, right? We were, you know, to get the word out, to get people to actually truly stop buying grapes and stop buying grapes at a level that the grape growers actually started to feel it. You guys are all now talented enough to you put the right social media message out there and boom, all of a sudden something's happening right away and people are being held accountable. So I think 
that's what needs to happen next is, you know, uh, really starting to go down the list of companies that spoke out and start to ask questions and ask them publicly or get shareholders to ask them in shareholder meetings. You know, and all, you know, sometimes people who are working for the company can also do that. Sometimes those of us on the outside have to recognize it's not always safe for someone who needs the job to raise the questions, which is where those of us who are activists on the outside come in, right? We should be the ones raising it uh, for the benefit of the folks who need to be working inside those companies so they can put food on their kids' tables. Another big difference from what you're talking about is that in my generation, things weren't illegal. There was no EEOC. There were no laws against discrimination, unequal pay, help wanted ads read, help wanted male, help wanted female. And you had to only apply within your own gender. Um, so we have, as you said earlier, Tina, we've come a long way, but we have a long way to go. And so I want to go to our last question, um, which is, what do you think it will take for women to finally break the glass ceiling and achieve not just the White House, either as president or vice president, but um, fair and equal conditions in the workplace in general? Well, we are going to have to, you know, keep up with this advocacy, right? And one of the things um, I want us all to be aware of is, regardless of the outcome on November 3rd, right, in the election, that all of this activity, you know, and these incredible numbers of people going to the polls that we're seeing, and the activism for the summer, you know, around Black Lives Matter cannot stop, regardless of outcome, regardless of whether Trump continues or Vice President Biden gets elected. That, you know, and especially actually if Vice President Biden gets elected, because I will tell you what we experienced 12 years ago. When President Obama got elected and went to the White House, and there were the great Grand Park celebration, right, and all the activity that it took to get him to be president. And then everybody went home, except for those of us who went to the White House to work, <laughs> right? Everybody else went home. And we spent like the next several years with everybody just looking to him to solve the problem by himself. And it doesn't happen that way. And it cannot happen that way. And I learned something from Gloria Steinem. In her most recent book, she writes about the fact that the most dangerous time for a progressive movement is often the moment right after a victory. And she cites, for example, the Civil War and emancipation as an example, that the most dangerous time for Black people in America happened right after emancipation because that was the birth of lynchings and Jim Crow and the Ku Klux Klan. And, you know, I take that to heart, which is, let's say, fingers, you know, fingers and toes crossed about what happens on November 3rd, if Vice President Biden becomes president and the progressive forces decide, oh, job done, the young, young people say, I showed up to vote, I kind of did my bit, time to go home. No, everyone needs to stay active at this level of activism um, to get things done, to help a new Biden administration get things done. And then here is the thing, Jill, that we now are gonna to have to do is I am deeply, deeply concerned about the change in the Supreme Court. So that now with the, under the cover of darkness, you know, confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett to the US Supreme Court and the other under cover of darkness, cause it all happened and without us even noticing the transformation of the lower courts by Mitch McConnell with the vacancies that he has filled that we now have to recognize as progressives that there are deeply conservative courts in the federal court system. And I think we have to recognize the federal court system as a vehicle for progressive change is gone, is gone. And worse than gone, that the federal court system is now a vehicle for conservative rollbacks. And that's what's going to happen. And so to combat it, we have got to actually take over the state houses Take over all of you know all of all of the legislatures, both federal and local, and pass laws because they say they're strict constructionists. So we have to actually pass laws to make clear to overturn bad opinions they're going to come out with to actually assert the rights both at the state level and the local level um, that we need to have because the federal court and even the precedent that we have relied on. And I'm not just talking about Roe versus Wade, but I'm talking about all the employment law precedent, right? Amy Coney Barrett has some of the worst employment law cases I've ever seen. She believes the use of the word N word, the N word in the workplace is not racial discrimination, right? That's the kind of woman who knows it's on the Supreme Court. And, 
you know, so we as activists actually have to be vigilant and now work even harder to enact actually statutes that will protect us. So that's the task ahead going forward. Definitely not an easy task, but I, I think your advice is so good for my generation because, you know, oftentimes I see with my peers as well, um, you know, we, we have those moments of victory and then, you know, sometimes some of us just um, stop working for uh, many of the issues that we want to see enacted. And so once Biden or whoever does get into the next administration, so important for them to keep up that um, advocacy that, you know, young people are so good at. Uh, that is really sound advice. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tina. This was really interesting and your work is so important. I hope everyone will check out your website and uh, support your work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so well, much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.